So welcome to the History of Western Philosophy and this first episode, Introduction to Early Greek Philosophy Part 1. So what I'm going to do in this episode is that I'll first introduce what's philosophy and how it will be defined, and then I'm going to go into Greek, Early Greek Philosophy, which, as you know, is the beginning of every branch of Western Philosophy. So moving on to definitions. There's a lot of definitions for the definition of philosophy, but I'm going to give one that Burton Rousseau, a British philosopher, gave. He said that philosophy was something that was not sciences nor theology. Basically, it's non-categorizable from the early sciences or something really humanitarian. It's something in the middle of sciences and theology. You can't really consider it science because it doesn't use a scientific method. You don't have a hypothesis, evidence, proof like that. But you do have some proof of reasoning, but you can't really say it's a theology because it doesn't rely on the Bible and some earlier thinkers. It's its own method, reasoning, and something that's outside of everything. So, Burton Russell considered something in the middle that's open to attack from both sides, and we're going to use that as the definition of philosophy. So, moving on to the early Greek philosophy. The real first philosophers who called themselves philosophers and had the real philosophy was the Malaysian school. They were independent thinkers beforehand, but this was the real first influence of philosophy anywhere in the world. So, the Malaysian school had one philosopher that you probably all know about. His name is Dallas. Now, he was a really famous philosopher. His famous city lasted from 600 to 550 BC, and which was his famous. Now, his major idea was that water was everything. Now, I know this sounds weird to people who just started philosophy or doesn't know anything, but this is quite rational if you look at his reasoning. What people did in this philosophy is called natural philosophy. People tried to see what constituted everything, and for Dallas, it was water. He said that water constitutes the balance of everything. Basically, this was one of his favorite sayings. If you step into a river, you will ne never step into the same river twice. In this way, water constitutes both a river, which is a solid thing, and changes which occur every day in our lives. So Thales was the beginning of the early Greek philosophy and the Malaysian school. The next person is called Anaximander. He was another famous philosopher in the 6th century BC, and in this case, he didn't think that everything was made out of water. He said that everything had a primitive element, which wasn't really named in his philosophy, but he said that it, because of this, there's a balance. There's no water or fire. He knew that those elements existed, but those weren't the things that made up the world. To him, there was this hidden element. It could be considered the modern atom, but to him, it was some invisible force that kept the balance around everything. And that was Alex Examiner's idea. The last philosopher who will be famous in the Ionian school was an Examinus. He was famous in the 500s BC, and in this case, he thought that air was everything. Something special about him is that instead of Dallas or Alexander, who thought that there were balances, but fire was the toughest thing of all, he said that air was everything because there's a degree of air everywhere. If something is hot, that has a lot of air. If something is cold, that has a little. In this way, he was the first one to constitute what got as a balance, and that air was the ruler of everything. Now, a philosopher after the Ionian school that's able to be mentioned is Pythagoras. You probably know that he's a mathematician, a pretty famous guy, but he was an interesting philosopher in his early days as well. So his most famous branch was math and the Pythagorean theorem and other works which have earned him some animosity, but something that's famous for him in philosophy circles is his religion. He had a weird, if I may so, religion that had all these laws of ethics and combined math with philosophy. People say it derived from Orphism, an early form of worshipping Dionysus, the god of wine. It had some similarities, but it's not really similar. So, his religion is a really famous thing. It had a lot of rules, 12 morals if I remember correctly, and he thought that there were souls and rebirths, basically everything that a religion has. It contrasted with Greek real religion, but this was considered a cult in those times. So, how he combined philosophy and religion is quite ingenious, actually. What he did was that he took those rules, souls, and reverses and said that this was the foundation of everything. He said that numbers made up everything from rules, souls, reverses, that there was a mathematical side to everything. In this case, he's not really wrong because he thought that there were rules that were ruled by numbers but still were rules of the universes that people can't obey or disobey and that's what he did. His influences with math, Pythagorean theorem, whatever, and the theme of combining religion with philosophy. Other thinkers up to Hegel combined mysticism, which is more considered not philosophy, with philosophy like what Pythagoras did. So the last philosophy we're going to deal with today is Heraclitus. Heraclitus is one of the most famous Greek philosophers in the world. So 
before mentioning Heraclitus, what we first need to go over is Xenophanus. Xenophanus is a philosopher who argued against polytheism, that there are many gods in the world. He said that there can't be many gods in the world because there's only one perfection, and if that's true, then there can't be other perfections. He believed in a monotheistic god, but that's he's not really important. What's important is that Pyth he mentions Pythagoras and Heraclitus mentions him, but that's not important either. Heraclitus was someone that was born in Ionia, but he's not considered a part of the Malaysian school. He never actually went to the school, he's just a national Ionian. The thing about Heraclitus is that there's a lot of factors to him. Well, the most famous, infamous thing about him is that he treated everyone as contempt. If you can look farther to the religion part, he said that every religion was false. But he didn't say this in a modern atheistic way. He said that every religion was false because it didn't, it wasn't compatible with his own branch of religion. So what he did was that he said that everyone's wrong except him. And that was a really contempt thing. Most philosophers in the olden days tried to convince people like Dallas or Alex Salmon or anyone. What they did is that they tried to persuade people to their own reasoning. Like later, Socrates, right? He held people and then he talked with them. But Heraclitus thought that he was the only one right and he didn't really care if people believed in it or not because he was absolutely convinced that he was the authority in everything. He thought that fire ruled everything. In this case, he said that fire was everything. It shadowed over everything, kind of like what other people mentioned, but in this case, it was something more. He believed that fire was everything because there were certain concepts that you can't see. See, he got this influence from Pythagoras who combined, again, his religion with philosophy. So what he said about the fire was that the fire was the universal justice. He said that fire held everything together and it was the concept in which overshadowed everything. He believed that everything was eternal. I mean, everything was eternally changing. What this means is that there's nothing that stays the same. When you when you wake up tomorrow, you're going to be a different person, right? You're not the same person you were at yesterday. That was his idea. If there's one, two things that he said lasted eternity, that's one, the concept of fire itself. He said that an unquenchable fire burned in the universe and controlled everything, and that was his idea. And the second part is about justice. He was the first philosopher to talk about justice. He said that the fire creates a balance between good and evil, bad and bad. Of course, the fire rules over everything, so creates this balance. And he believed that this justice was what shadowed over all of the world. So, in the next episode, I'm going to talk about philosophers who directly contradict with Heraclitus, Heraclitus and other people. Thank you.